I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco in for Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, investors sink their teeth into FANG. Big tech delivers strong returns despite a still shaky U.S.-China trade picture. Morgan Stanley says companies like Apple have room to run. We'll have the latest market action. Plus, scrap the roadshow. Food delivery company DoorDash considers a direct listing instead of an IPO. Why it may be the most desirable path to go in public. And the 5G revolution. We'll hear from Qualcomm CEO Stephen Mollenkopf on the race for 5G. It is China versus the U.S. But first to our top story, the Nasdaq climbing to a fresh record on the back of gains in mega cap tech companies, even as the Dow sank following disappointing reports from retailers. Some big tech names leading the way from the Nasdaq were Facebook, Broadcom and Tesla. All of this comes as investors mold the implications of a report that the U.S. and Chinese negotiators may link the size of tariff rollbacks to terms set during talks in May. For more, I want to head on over to New York where Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter Sarah Ponzak is standing by. Sarah, are we just ignoring the trade headlines? I don't know if we're completely ignoring the trade he headlines, at least the good ones as the ones we got today as Bloomberg reported that maybe the U.S. is softening its stance on those tariff rollbacks. That clearly did engage a little bit more of a positive outlook, but the negative headlines do seem to almost be being ignored. You take a day like yesterday, for example, Early on in the morning, there was a tweet out from a bureau chief over in Beijing from CNBC. She noted that the tone over in China is very pessimistic, that they were kind of unfortunately seeing that the U.S. wasn't going to roll back those tariffs and they were saying that they were going to hold out for a period of time, really focus on stimulating their economy instead. And still at the same time, just yesterday, we had the S&P 500 Information Technology Index hit a new high. You had Apple hit a new high. So the good news seemed to still being rewarded. However, the bad news, as you said, do seem at this point in time to be being a bit ignored. And it's not just in tech. We're seeing that within the broader market as well. You know, Sarah, you mentioned Apple, and I want to come and take a look at a chart that I'm showing here inside my terminal, which is Apple and Microsoft, and the market value approaching two and a quarter trillion dollars and exceeding the entire market cap of the consumer staples index. How much of this is cause of overvaluation or FOMO? We just have a fear of missing out on this massive rally. This chart is pretty unbelievable. You think of the entire consumer staples index in the S&P made up of about 30 companies or so. And these are large companies at that. Another statistic that has been being floated around is the combined market cap of Apple and Microsoft now supersedes or exceeds that of the in Russell 2000. Yes, smaller companies, but think about that. Two companies have a larger market cap than 2,000 companies combined. It's pretty unbelievable. And there is a possibility that heading into the end of the year, we do see FOMO really pick up regarding some of these companies, high-flying companies. You think of Apple up near 70% this year. Some funds are doing window dressing at this point in time. If you are lagging your benchmark, you might want to grasp onto some of these high flyers. But we have seen some differentiation within the whole FANG complex. We mentioned Apple up about 70%. You have Microsoft and Facebook both up 50%. So that's about double return of the S&P 500 so far this year. But then you look at the likes of Google Parent Alphabet. You do look at Amazon, which are lagging the market this year. So although it is very possible that we do do see FOMO pick up for some of these high flyers. We are still seeing a bit of a differentiation within those FANG names that are often grouped together. And within the idea of differentiation, bear with me because I'm pulling another terminal chart here on my terminal GTB Go, which again highlights the market cap of Apple more than the entire S&P 500 energy sector. And this isn't a story about Apple. To me, Sarah, this highlights the concerns really here about growth over a dividend pain sector, a value sector. Are we starting to see a rotation out of value into growth? So what I do find very interesting is if you actually just look, yes, there's many different ways you can measure value and growth, but you look at the S&P 500 value index versus the growth index, it's actually on track to outpace it for the third straight month. This is the first time we're going to see a streak of that sort since back in 2016. However, when it comes to tech, it's difficult because you 
have to think of it being broken into three different industries, at least you think of within the S&P 500. So you have semiconductors, you have software, and you also have hardware as well. And what's interesting for tech, up 40% about this year, it's the best year for the tech index at large since 2009, you actually see tech outperforming on the days that we see cyclicals and value outperforming, but we also see tech outperforming on the days that we've seen defensives and safer areas of the market outperforming as well. And part of this does come down to that industry breakdown. So for example, if you were to look at the beginning of September to just before last week, that was when we really did see that value outperformance, that cyclical outperformance. At the same time within tech, we saw outperformance in areas like hardware and also semiconductors as well. Lately though, the last week or so, the last 10 days or so, we have seen that resumption of defensives outperforming like utilities, like real estate, even healthcare as well. But technology is still within the mix. And the reason for that is now you're starting to see software outperform. And I do think this is an interesting take to be aware of just because we were just talking about software coming under pressure due to those high growth prospects. Mm, well, Bloomberg, Sarah Ponzak breaking down all of the market action for us. Thanks for joining. And we switch gears from tech to tech regulation in Washington. A group of Democratic senators want any federal data privacy law to include criminal penalties for violators. For more, I want to go down to Washington where Bloomberg's Ben Brody has more. Ben, what kind of criminal penalties are we looking at? Uh, well, it's a little bit unclear. This was a very high-level statement of principles that the Democrats are going to proceed from as they develop uh, privacy legislation. But we have seen a proposal uh, from Democratic Senator Ron Wyden uh, that would send, or could send these executives to jail for knowing willful violations of a legal duty. So there are a lot of prongs to that. Uh, but basically, uh, you knew it was against the law. You meant to do it. You told someone to do it. Uh, and then it was actually against the law, something you were actually supposed to do. So there are a lot of prongs to that. Uh, it's not necessarily that uh, executives would be going to jail every day, uh, but it's something that would be hovering in the background as a sort of incentive uh, to keep right with the laws. A lot of these are sort of rhetorically uh, aimed at Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. A lot of Democrats say uh, if he'd faced these sorts of incentives, uh, the company wouldn't have had so many uh, problems with the FTC over the years. I wonder how Democrat and Republican ideas on this differ. Uh, they differ quite significantly. As you can imagine, Republicans uh, don't like the idea of sending big company CEOs to jail uh, pretty regularly. Uh, they don't like the idea necessarily of state attorneys general enforcing this, although there's been some compromise there. They don't like the idea of consumers suing to enforce privacy rights. That's something else uh, that Democrats said really needs to be on the table and part of any conversation in this statement of high-level principles. Uh, but I think it's worth saying one place that they largely agree or have agreed uh, over the last year in my reporting, that's on giving the FTC the ability to fine companies for a first violation across across a range of violations. That's something they don't have now. And for the most part, there's actually bipartisan agreement on it. And so, Ben, to be given a penalty, a criminal penalty, you would have to knowingly break the law. What are some of the other issues you would have to do to get this criminal penalty? Uh, so again, it's a relatively high-level statement of principles, but you're going to be looking at uh, the Democrats wanting to allow consumers to, uh, say, opt out of data collection or opt out of data sharing uh, within a particular company. So you wouldn't have that situation where uh, you collect information maybe to improve the product and then it goes to advertising. And so if you have executives knowingly, willfully violating that, and again, that's the Ron Wyden model. Uh, that's not necessarily what these principles are saying, but that's the one we're kind of looking at. Uh, you might have a situation where the FTC comes at them and says, hey, we, we kind of have a lever over you here. Uh, you need to come and work with us a little bit. And I think that's what the companies are really worried about, is the government having that lever in negotiations. Well, Ben, we know it's never a slow day when it comes to tech, antitrust in Washington, D.C. You were out with another story today talking about the big four, Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, Apple, pushing back on House Committee uh, antitrust panel that's leading the antitrust investigations. Those tech companies are pushing back. What did we learn about what those tech companies are saying? 
Uh, one of the most fascinating things uh, that I saw in these documents uh, was Amazon basically conceding that it does uh, demote third-party merchants if they're offering uh, lower lower prices on other uh, retail e-commerce portals uh, like Walmart or uh, eBay or Etsy or someplace like that. Uh, that's something when I talk to antitrust experts, they say uh, that they really think the FTC is going to want to dig into that and see if Amazon is using uh, pricing power to basically uh, affect that change. Uh, and it's something that in my reporting, the FTC actually is looking at. And so for the company to come out and say, we are actually doing this, I thought was actually uh, somewhat of, a, of an important uh, admission. I think it is important for them to say the reason that we do that is so that we can offer our customers the lowest uh, prices and there's no uh, consumer harm there. There's no competition or antitrust uh, concern there. So they're certainly offering a robust defense. But I did think it was an interesting concession by the company. Bloomberg's Ben Brody, thank you for joining us. And coming up, it is a lump of coals for investor stockings. The retailer gives a bad forecast despite its partnership with Amazon. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Not an encouraging sign for Kohl's heading into the retail season. Shares of the retailer dropping by as much as 19% in trading on Tuesday. This comes after Kohl's reported third quarter earnings, missing sales estimates, and cutting its full year profit forecast for the second time this year. Bloomberg retail reporter Jordan Holman joins us now from New York. Jordan, the whole point was this partnership with Amazon. Is it not working? So that's one thing that's, um, that Kohl's is doing. But what they said today was that they missed on women's apparel, which is a key part of their strategy of being a department store, is appealing to women. But in addition to um, the merchandise miss, they're also launching a lot of new brands. Um, and so that's also weighing on their outlook. So that was some of the uh, reasons that the CEO gave for cutting their um, forecast. And then in addition, there's this part of a larger retail environment that's struggling and being a department store has not been great over the past few years. So they're trying to navigate that environment. Well, and it hasn't been great in part of what you alluded to, just the changing landscape of retail and having to take on the big e-commerce giants like Amazon. And so they use that partnership. They're actually looking to expand it, right, nationwide. Is this really the right time to be expanding that partnership? So Kohl's definitely thinks it is. They expanded the partnership earlier this year um, to more than their 1,000 stores. And part of the idea of having this partnership is that when people bring in Amazon returns to the Kohl's stores, they're staying around to browse a little to maybe buy some of the activewear or the home um, decor that Kohl's sells. And so um, today, Michelle Gass, who's uh, Kohl's CEO, said she's encouraged and pleased by the results they see so far um, and that it could actually contribute to the operating profit that the company has, but there's still not as many details as analysts might want to have um, about how successful that partnership is. Any thoughts on new buyers, a younger audience that they're hoping to gain by luring in Amazon to their a partnership, if you will. Yeah, so the Amazon partnership, one big thing that Kohl's says it brings is younger shoppers and new shoppers to Kohl's that might not come before. So Kohl's has really focused in on the millennial mom and making sure that they're offering product for the mom and the kid. So part of it is they want to bring the shopper into the store, drop off the package, and then hopefully, you know, stick around and realize that, hey, Kohl's has things for, you know, makeup and jewelry and things that you might not think about Kohl's for. Um, but it's challenging because there's a lot of other retailers who are after that same customer so it's it's you, they have to have a value add that you know other places don't Jordan any thoughts on the analyst call I'm reading our BI analyst piece for example and they're saying a big a sort of positive catalyst for the stock could be the digital store fulfillment pick up and store of mobile app purchases any sense of how digital fulfillment and those mobile store pickups can really help this company going forward yeah, I think every big retailer, um, department stores, specialty apparel, they're looking for the next big thing. And that um, 
buy online, pick up in store is a big part of it. So making, taking the friction out of the shopping experience is what Kohl's and other of its peers are looking for. And so there weren't too many details around that, but it goes along with the Amazon partnership. Basically, they want to get people in the store and hopefully buy more while they're there. Um, and that will be tested out during this critical holiday season um, where they expect you know foot traffic to pick up. And Michelle Gass, uh, Kohl's CEO, said, Kohl's really, um, it's a great test for the holidays because that's when they shine. So hopefully all of those things they've been working on in 2019 will come into fruition. Bloomberg's Jordan Holman, thank you for joining us. Now, how to head to the public market, an initial public offering or a direct listing? Most private tech companies are weighing their options, but it looks like unprofitable food delivery service DoorDash is leaning towards a direct stock listing, and that could come as early as next year. To discuss, we get to bring in Bloomberg Technologies' Candy Chang. Very interesting, why the direct listing over an IPO? Yeah, so one of the reasons why DoorDash is considering a direct listing over a traditional IPO is because it allows them to avoid the scrutiny that comes with an investor roadshow. Um, they can also list the shares directly without having to raise new money. Just last week, uh, DoorDash raised $100 million from T. Rowe Price. And when I last spoke to the CEO, Tony Hsu, he told me that the company was very well positioned, that they have money in the bank, and that he was in no hurry to really spend at all. A lot more tech companies that we've been following have been choosing this route. Why? Who do they join the ranks of now? Yeah, so Spotify last year was really the first major company to choose this unconventional method of going public. And uh, Slack this year soon followed. And uh, we have reported that Airbnb is next in line to really consider this as a way to go public next year. You know, it's interesting when we talk about DoorDash, this is such a competitive CapEx heavy space that they are investing in and they've said that they are not profitable. How is DoorDash positioned within this very competitive environment? Yeah, so we uh, pulled a study from Edison Trends, which is a consumer report, and um, they they reported that 35% of consumer spending is led by DoorDash. They've been really able to succeed in this space by conquering the suburbs of the United States with partnerships uh, with the Chili, Chili's restaurants and also with Wendy's as well. So DoorDash has uh, in total raised $2 billion in its lifetime. Much of that came in the last 18 months and they are valued at nearly $13 billion today. Well, like you said, if they've cashed on hand, much simpler, avoid the roadshow, do a direct listing. Bloomberg Technologies, Candy Chang, thank you for joining us. Thanks. And coming up, popular vaping company Juul is being sued by New York State for allegedly breaking its laws. That's our conversation next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. New York is suing Juul for allegedly violating the state marketing laws by targeting teenagers in its ads. The cigarette company is also accused of misleading statements about nicotine content in its products. The lawsuit, which was announced on Tuesday, comes just one day after California filed a similar complaint against Juul. Joining us to discuss it is Bloomberg Technologies' Ellen Hewitt. Ellen, it feels like the pressure continues to mount California, New York. Where does that leave Juul? Juul is under a ton of pressure right now from its seemingly many different regulatory bodies, um, state prosecutors, and, and the list goes on and on. So in addition to, as we mentioned, New York State um, Attorney General and the California Attorney General, back in May they had faced actually a similar suit from the Attorney General of North Carolina. You know, they have probes and inquiries from the FTC. Um, the CDC is looking into health effect. Like, it just seems like every agency that you can think of that might have some connection to Juul is, is 
taking action to show like we're not you know we're not just going to sit idly by um, while while we see this epidemic as the FDA has called it of youth vaping. What is a bigger concern here? Is it the fact that they were marketing to teenagers or the fact that they had some misleading statements about how addictive nicotine can be and that nicotine was in their products? It seems like it's both you know I've heard many um, anti vaping advocates or concerned parents talk about something that seems maybe surprising to adult consumers um, this idea that some teens or children may not know that there's nicotine in Juul products, um, but that is a concern that I've heard people discuss, and it seems like that is something that's coming up in relation to some of the advertising that Juul has done. In some of these cases more recently, it does seem like there's also these marketing tactics around both using advertisements that had sort of a youthful look and colorful color themes and, and young models. That was a concern, as well as in one of these suits, I believe it's in the California one, Juul's accused of of consistently shipping products to um, customers who maybe had names that were obviously not real. One of them was a customer who filled out their name as beer can. You know, and this is stuff where I think they were saying that Juul was just, you know, not, you know, they were saying that they, of course, don't want youth using their products, but they were looking for examples where it seemed like they weren't putting in the effort to stop it. You know, it was, it was interesting. I was reading the story and it said from the New York State Attorney General said that Juul basically basically took a page from Big Tobacco's playbook. And it just strikes me as, how was Juul able to do this? And now it's had dozens of deaths. What is it doing that Big Tobacco wasn't doing? Because Big Tobacco has been relatively okay recently. So why is Juul now all of a sudden in trouble? Well, I think there's been decades in which Big Tobacco has then over time been more and more regulated in terms of what you can advertise. You know, um, you just don't see the same sorts of advertisements for um, cigarettes that you would have 30 or 40 years ago. Um, that being said, I think then people are looking at the way that Juul has employed allegedly some of the same tactics that Big Tobacco used many years ago, such as going into schools and, and doing education programs about um, addiction and things like that, but them being sponsored by Juul. This is something that Juul did that came up in congressional hearings that many people have cited as a way that Juul is sort of copying that same playbook. And for their part, Juul come out, came out and said that they're, you know, continuing to be committed to resetting the vapor category and earning the trust of society. But I wonder from a business standpoint, we know that they had a partnership with Altria, but the Altria Philip Morris deal has been called off in part because of the concerns over Juul and vaping. Where are they from a business standpoint? I think I've been sensing from the company that they have really, really been trying to put their public message saying we, we really want to be compliant, we really want to be careful, um, and we really want to earn back the trust of American consumers. And, and this has been an interesting pattern. You know, I think one thing that's been challenging for them, as you mentioned, these vaping deaths have been a big part of the headlines. In fairness to Juul, many of the vaping deaths, as we learn more about them, those have been connected to THC related vapes that have in many cases vitamin E and other additives that Juul says are is not present in their products they just are getting a lot of heat for it because they are the biggest e-cigarette company um, in the U.S. and abroad so it's been a complicated time for them reputationally as well. Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt thanks for joining us. And still ahead, Qualcomm CEO says it is important for the U.S. and China to work together to make 5G an international standard. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. Let's get a look at today's top tech calls. Starting with Disney, they were raised to a street high of $175 a share from analysts at Rosenblatt Securities. The analyst cited faster than expected signups for Disney Plus streaming video service, which he says may reach 35 million globally by the end of 2020. An internal survey about streaming video suggests high awareness of Disney Plus and that a high percentage of users will stay on the service after a one week free trial. And shares of AT&T fell after Moffitt Nathanson downgraded the stock to a rare sell with a $30 price target. Analyst Craig Moffitt finds it hard to imagine the company's recently issued three-year guidance can be achieved. The entertainment group unit, in short, is a cancer, he said, and the business wireline unit is shrinking around 4%. 
And Intel was raised to a price target of $64 a share at Mizuho on their pricing power. The analyst said Intel is getting aggressive on cutting prices, and that pricing could position Intel to aggressively compete with AMD. Separately, B of A reiterated its buy rating on Intel after the company announced a new graphics processing unit. And those were a look at your top tech calls. Now, Qualcomm has been front and center in the development of 5G networks, including its strong partnership with Apple and some of China's biggest telecom firms. CEO Steve Melenkoff sat down with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde on Monday to discuss his views on Apple and how China's doing in the 5G race. I think it's good. I mean, it's really focused on the things that the two companies naturally do well together, which is work on products. Mm. Uh, and you know, when, when you get engineers talking to engineers, uh, things work out pretty well. And that's where we are today. So the 5G relationship can be a real springboard for you, do you think? I think so. I think you know what 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 you know the kind of the hallmark of our company. And really, if you look, what. 30,000 people do every day is work on products. And when the engagement with a partner, whomever that partner would be, uh, that's a very natural relationship for us. And since everyone's so interested in driving 5G and it's a, you know, it's a long roadmap to do that, um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of natural discussions going on in the product area. And that's, that's a very comfortable place, I think, for both companies to be in. What about the discomfort of the fact that they've bought the Intel modem chip part of the business? How long do you think, therefore, this partnership will last between Qualcomm and Apple? You know, uh, I think a long time. I mean, if you if you think about it, we we're not uh, unaccustomed to dealing with or, or working with a customer that maybe has multiple sources of supply. Some of them could be internal. Uh, but what we find is that uh, if we're competing, let's say, in the areas that we're very good at, and certainly we're very good at the modem, uh, we, we figure out a way to continue to, to expand our business or continue our business. That's been true you know, for a decade or decade plus for us, and I don't, I don't think it'll be any different here. What about the competition coming from China? And in particular, Huawei is becoming more self-sufficient. They're able to perhaps gain some market share over there. You have a relationship with Huawei. We do. How is that relationship, and how is it with partners in China at the moment? You know, our China business is actually quite strong. It's really driven by the same things that we, we talked about already, 5G and, and all of these, uh, you know, same kind of worldwide expansion of the opportunity of cellular. Of course, we have a very strong business in China, a lot of partners, including Huawei, that we sell to. Um, and it continues to be, you know, a big, a big opportunity and a big, big business for us. And I would say in some ways, actually, um, uh, isolated or insulated from some of the trade discussions. Mm. Uh, if you look, there's a lot of expansion happening worldwide with 5G in China. Qualcomm's a big piece of that. And uh, it's a real kind of classic story of if you have technology that people want or need or, or, you know, and you're the strongest partner or a strong partner, you have the ability to figure out ways that you can win-win. That's certainly been the case for us. So you don't feel the business has been curtailed at all? We've had a little bit of the change in the, I would say, the structure of the Chinese market as the Huawei handset uh, business is really retrenched into um, into China. It's changed the the um, the share a bit. And actually, what people have done in reaction is they said, "Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to accelerate my 5G plans, and I'm not going to spend so much time on 4G." Mm. And so, what has really happened is it's accelerated the intensity of the the 5G rollout, and not just at the high end. It's actually gone down into into several tiers below the premium tier. Uh, we're spending a lot of time getting the Chinese partners successful. Do you think China's ahead of the US in terms of 5G? Well, I would say not from the technology perspective. Um, and you know, the, the sort of the uh, behind the scenes look is we're all working together to make 5G. If China and the United States don't work together to make 5G an international standard, mm -hmm. then you'll really miss an opportunity worldwide. Uh, and you're not seeing that. You're seeing people cooperate in terms of the technology. Mm. That's the standards body. But if you look at the deployment, the speed at which base stations are rolling out, uh, China's actually going quite fast. I think I made some comments about how it was going to be 130,000 base stations by the end of the year and a million next year in China alone. Those are tremendously large numbers if you put it in, the, in comparison to what you see in the United States. But that doesn't mean the United States isn't going quickly as well. It's just that you're seeing, uh, uh, for the first time in cellular, you're seeing China and the United States launching in the same calendar year. They used to be separated by two years or five years, depending on the generation. But now everyone worldwide is trying to figure out how to get to 5G quickly, and that's, that's been good for us. What about good for your revenue flows? We've had f years of negative revenue in terms of a lack of growth. Is 2020 the turning point for you, therefore? We do. We, we, we think it's going to be a good year for both top line and the bottom line, really driven by this 5G. And, and a lot of things that people already know, 
about our business. They'll just see them uh, happen throughout the year, and we're, we're pleased to uh, have that opportunity. What don't we know about your business? I think what people don't realize is this, the opportunity that we have outside of the handset space. It's really, you know, we have a tremendous technology pipeline as a result of being strong in the smartphone space. Mm. And it ends up that that technology is, is really valuable for us to disrupt um, these big industries that are being disrupted by 5G. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity to have to figure out how we leverage that technology pipeline into these new industries. And uh, I think people, as they learn about that and they see kind of what we see, they'll be, they'll be very excited about it. You care about the share price? Well, I'm very happy where it is, uh, you know, and uh, it always feels better to have it up. But you have to always be paying attention to the kind of the fundamentals of how the business continues to go. And sometimes, um, you know, it, it, it's reflected in the share price. Sometimes it's not. Of course, we, you probably know, we just got, we finished a large buyback one of the largest in, in probably corporate history, bought back 20 plus percent of our shares because we thought that they were undervalued and it seems like that was, that's gonna turn out to be a good investment. Uh, and you know, we keep driving 5G, we keep driving these opportunities, we, uh, we hope it's gonna be reflected in the share price. That was Qualcomm CEO Steve Mollenkoff. Now, Oracle has delayed a decision to replace its late CEO, Mark Hurd. Hurd died last month after taking a short medical leave. For now, Oracle's succession plan is to leave control in the hands of Chairman Larry Ellison and Hurd's fellow CEO, Safford Katz. Ellison has put forth five candidates, but none has emerged as the front runner. And coming up from competition in the cloud to competition in gaming, Google is looking to take the number one spot. We'll discuss how Google plans to take on gaming consoles by switching to the cloud. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Google is taking over a chunk of Vodafone's data operations to help the world's second biggest mobile phone company identify cost savings using artificial intelligence. Vodafone will shift data processing and storage from its own premises to Google's cloud. This comes as Google continues to compete with both Amazon and Microsoft for dominance in data centers and cloud computing. Joining us to discuss Bloomberg Technologies, Alistair Barr. Is it really all about AI and cloud that was funding this deal? I think for Google, it certainly is. So Amazon, Amazon is the leader in the cloud. Microsoft is second. Google is a relatively distant third. And, and the thing that they're really good at and, and were pioneering at is, is AI. So what they do is they, they used AI for a lot of other things in the past, but they basically turned that technology into a service that they rent over the cloud. And uh, that has been productized, I would say, in the last two years or so pretty well and that this Vodafone deal is, is a good example where basically Vodafone might have chosen someone else in the mm -hmm. past but, they, but they, they, they want to get access to that AI and one of the only ways they can do it is by, is by renting it through a cloud service with Google. You mentioned that Google was a relatively distant third. Does this deal even move the needle? I think if they keep doing deals like this, I, th I think it could begin to move the needle because Vodafone is a, is a very mm -hmm. big customer and they, they have a massive amount of data and they have, they have huge data centers of their own that they are actually keeping uh, for, uh, for other purposes. But, but yeah, this is, this is a very big deal. So it, it, it maybe maybe 20 more of these deals and they might start to catch up. So is it pricing? How are they getting these deals over an Amazon or a Microsoft? When they, when Google initially really went hard into the into the cloud space about two or three years ago, they did start with it with a with a pricing message that they, they did different ways of pricing, which made it which made a, a lot of um, processes run in their data centers to be to be cheaper. But most cloud users aren't aren't really necessarily just looking for for cost savings; they're looking for a bunch of other benefits as well, like scalability and things like that. So 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 really. When you're, if you want to be a real competitor with Amazon, especially, you, you need a broad, a broad offering of, of different things, and it has to work with a lot of other different software. Um, so, so AI has to fit into a, mu a much broader strategy for Google. Well, and you said along the lines this week, they made another acquisition within the cloud company of Cloud Simple. Again, yes. you have to fund more deals to try to keep up. 
That's right. And, and Cloud Simple, it, it, it actually is quite complex what it does in the, in the background. But that, that deal is a, is a classic example of, of what Google needs to do. So, so that, that, that company serves enterprise big companies and they have, they have data in their own data centers, which they manage in a quite traditional way. And then they want to move some of that data to, to a, a, cloud, a cloud service. It could be Amazon, it could be Microsoft or Google. And Cloud Simple handles all that. And so they have enterprise customers that Google really lacks right now. So when they, when, they, when they do a deal like that, they're not only buying that technology, but they're buying the customer list as well. So that could be quite valuable. I wonder if all of these deals antagonize lawmakers and regulators who've been talking about antitrust. It is, it is quite notable. So this year, there have been, there've been three. I don't, I don't think the Cloud Simple deal was huge, mm -hmm. but there was another one called Looker, which was well over $2 billion. And then there's the Fitbit one, which isn't really on cloud, but, it's, uh, but it was also above $2 billion. So Google is really, really going, going for it and hoping that, that, that it can um, get these things passed for sure. Bloomberg Technologies, Alastair Barr, thanks for joining us. And sticking with Google, the company has finally launched its long-awaited cloud gaming service, Stadia. Using Stadia allows users to stream and play games via smartphones and web browsers, ditching the old clunky console. Some are calling it the Netflix of gaming. Others aren't totally sold yet. For more, I want to bring in Arcadium president Kenny Rosenblatt. Arcadium is a founder-led games company that has developed over 100 titles across PCs and browsers and mobile devices so Kenny was it successful how was Stadia well I think Stadia is a long-term play for Google I think coming right out of the gate uh, there are a lot of naysayers out there but on the positive side it is a very very advanced technical solution but technical solutions don't sell game consoles what sells game consoles are games and the lineup that Stadia came out with leaves a lot to be de desired Okay, so what do you want to see from the game lineup, given your history in that space, to help boost the appeal? Yeah, you need exclusivity. You need games that are exclusive to the platform. If you think Nintendo, you think about Mario and Luigi. If you think about Microsoft, you think about Halo. What is Stadia's exclusive content that will make users and players want to come to that platform. Right now they have I think 22 games at launch that you can play just about anywhere else. Well and Kenny it was notable, notable that I was reading some of the reviews online they're not entirely positive and so I wonder what inning you think we're in if this is a nine inning series are we really just in the early stages? Oh we're, we're way earlier than that I mean uh, you know Stadia should talk to their friends at Microsoft and ask them about their entrance into the, uh, the gaming market. This needs to be a long term play for Google we're talking 10 plus years years not just because of the technology adoption that needs to occur but they need to get their feet wet in developing content nobody thinks of Google as a content company they really need to forge relationships with developers they need to really understand what it means to foster a gaming community and they need to build on this if this is not like a 10 year plus commitment then I think uh, they may th just throw their hat in the ring how do they differentiate themselves in terms of their target audience? Well, one of the problems with Stadia right now is that they don't know who their target audience is. And they're trying to be everyone to everything. And uh, it's just uh, confusing. So a lot of people are saying that this is the Netflix for games. Well, in Netflix, you actually don't pay for the movies that you are going to watch. In Stadia, they have a subscription, and then you have to pay for something. So it's sending a very confusing message to the market. Market, which is why a lot of people have this wait and see attitude. So Kenny, I unfortunately am not a gamer just yet. So describe to me how big this market segment is. What is the potential that Google sees? Yeah, what I love about Google's move here is that the gaming market is over $150 billion worldwide. That's a monster market. It's bigger than television and movies combined. So I like that they're going after a really large market, but they have to um, you know, stick with it for years to come. Additionally, this is a market that's growing. There's mobile devices in everybody's pocket, and this, this market has grown over 9% just from last year. So they're on the right trend. They're just going to have to stick it out. So then who's the next competitor? 
I think Amazon is definitely going to run into this space. I think with their acquisition of Twitch, that um, you know, showcased that um, that. Um, excitement about this market and you know Microsoft has long been here uh, so there's a lot of cloud gaming companies out there that have deep roots in gaming that I think have a really good shot of taking a large percentage of this market share but the race is on let's see what happens I like that the race is on let's see what happens that's Arcadian president Kenny Rosenblatt thank you for joining now we are getting an idea of what Alibaba shares are anticipated to start trading when they list on the Hong Kong market. The Chinese e-commerce giant is said to guide pricing of Hong Kong share sales around 176 Hong Kong dollars. Trading is expected to begin next week. And still ahead, Warby Parker goes daily. The eyeglass retailer wants to bring contact lenses directly to you. We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg. Crypto entrepreneurs Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss just made their first ever acquisition. And the duo behind the company they bought couldn't be more similar. Duncan and Griffin Cock Foster are also identical twins. The Winklevosses were Olympic rowers and the Cock Fosters rowed in high school. The company they sold to the Winklevosses is Nifty Gateway. It lets people buy digital collectibles with a credit card. Terms of the deal were not disclosed. And can you make contact lenses cool? That's what Warby Parker is hoping for. The retailer that is one of the pioneers of the current direct-to-consumer craze is hoping that $440 a year daily contacts will be as appealing to shoppers as co-CEO Dave Gilboa hopes. We're super excited to be able to introduce a daily contact lens um, at a much uh, better price point than you can find elsewhere in the market. And, um, and it's really the first opportunity for um, contact lens wearers that um, have been wearing extended wear, so two week or monthly lenses, uh, really their first opportunity to enter into an affordable uh, daily contact lens. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Austin Carr, who's written about this in this week's edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Austin, this seems like a very seamless vertical strategy from glasses now to contact lenses. That's correct. I think there was a big question uh, about what would Warby Parker do next. They pioneered this sort of di direct to consumer companies. You've seen a lot of knockoffs like Allbirds, Casper, spread into things like shoes and mattresses. And so there was a big question about whether or not Warby Parker would spread into other product verticals or uh, perhaps double down on vision care, which is really what they've done by expanding from glasses to contacts. Austin, what is it about this company? Is it the marketing, the seamless website, the coolness factor? How does this company able to just get it done? We, we've talked to a lot of retail analysts from the story, and it's really interesting. It's, it's almost impossible to describe. They, they sort of uh, hint at these intangible, uh, yeah, end-to-end -end customer experiences that just transform it from a transaction to more of an emotional experience. Uh, but that might well work with glasses, which are a, you know a trendy fashion item. It becomes a part of your identity. In fact. The ones I'm wearing right now are Warby Parker glasses. Uh, but the big question is whether or not they can they can have that same brand effect both with customers as well as in-store at retail shops uh, when it comes to contacts, which, uh, as you know, are an invisible commodity. This is a, a really a piece of plastic that you put on your eye. Uh, and so can Warby Parker actually sort of convey that same brand affinity for something that just disappears on your face? And so much of that brand revolves around the marketing campaign. What is their current marketing or advertising plan? Does that change with contacts? Uh, it definitely does. You know, um, for glasses, if you go into their shop, they're splayed out everywhere. Uh, it's very a uh, bespoke design that makes it fun to try on. They have this fun online experience where you get five pairs at home uh, for free, try them on, and just pay $95 for the ones that you like and send them back to Warby Parker. For contacts, it's more of a medical experience. Uh, so you actually have to go see a doctor to get a prescription before you can get contacts. Uh, it, it's much more about custom fit. So a lot of what they've done is seamless streamline that process. They've hired more optometrists on staff, bringing their total up to about 80, and also built out exam rooms, uh, exam suites as they call them, in their stores to sort of uh, simplify that experience so people can get their prescription at the same time they meet with their eye doctor. And they want to just bring that all in one place and just simplify the process to make it, uh, I guess, less dull than going to your traditional eye doctor. 
How much more of a regulatory burden though is this? I was very surprised to read in your analysis that contacts have the same oversight as hearing aids, as pregnancy kits. How much more of a regulatory burden does this present the company? I, I think it's a significant more challenge, especially as they move more into the field of telemedicine. This is the idea that you can actually update your prescriptions by uh, just your phone at home. You can uh, sort of do a vision test on your laptop and verify it with your phone, which submit it, uh, submits it online to a Warby Parker doctor who can verify it. And a lot of the optometry community that we spoke with, they're a little bit concerned about this technology and where it's heading. Uh, Warby Parker right now just uses it for glasses, but they hope to one day bring it to contacts. And we've seen other internet-centric eyewear makers such as Hubble invisibly get into trouble for doing that uh, with customers. There's been talk of uh, infections and things of that nature. And, and the big challenge for Warby Parker will be whether they can streamline and do it safely. And that's what they're really trying to do with this launch. Austin, we only have about 30 seconds or so. Where are they at ease at those at home eye tests? Sorry, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Where are they at the convenience, the at home eye tests? They are, uh, their most convenient is, uh, you know, definitely a at home experience, but they want to bring more shoppers into the stores, which is why they're bringing more doctors uh, uh, into their stores as well to make it sort of an end to end uh, retail experience that spans into the medical space as well. Bloomberg's Austin Carr handling that curveball. I just threw at him very well. Thank you <laughs> Thank for you joining so us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.